Well, morning, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. My name is Matt Fry from UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and I've been hosting this um, series of webinars in uh, NERT Constructing a Digital Environment Programme. I think this is the I thought, seventh series of webinars, and this is the seventh and final webinar in this in this series, which is on AI and environmental science. And it's yeah, as I said, it's part of the Constructing Digital Environment Programme. So this is a programme aimed to develop digitally enabled environment, benefiting researchers, policymakers, businesses, communities, and individuals alike. Um, it's been running since 2019. I've had a series of projects uh, with the aim of sort of envisaging and developing approaches to creating the future digital environment and exploiting advances in technology and increasingly diverse data sets to improve our understanding and management management of the environment. It runs an expert network and has had a series of events, including a very successful conference very recently. Worth pointing out, there's an event coming up in, in a few weeks at the Royal Society in London on the 5th of September, and our registration is open now. It's called um, Digital, the Key to Unlocking Environmental Challenges, and I believe this is the kind of finale event of the programme, so it'll be summarising lots of the projects and work that's been undertaken as part of the project. Um, this is, uh, like I said, it's the seventh series of webinars that the programs run. We invite a presentation from a leading expert in the field, followed by a chance for some Q&A. Today, the, the final one in the series is from Tom Anderson of the British Antarctic Survey. He's going to be talking about tackling diverse environmental prediction tasks with neural processes. So Tom's a machine learning research scientist at the British Antarctic Survey AI Lab, where he researches and develops uh, machine learning systems for monitoring and ad adapting to climate change. His work currently focuses on the application and implementation of neural processes in environmental sciences, and I'm going to explain a bit about, about that today. Tom's used uncertainty quantification, interpretability, and active learning methods to build decision support tools. Uh, and his previous work includes IceNet, a C -ice uh, forecasting AI system. And with that, I'll hand over to Tom. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Matt. So yeah, assuming you're all seeing my screen. Yeah, thanks so much for the introduction and for the opportunity to present today. Um, I've been following the webinar series and it's been amazing. So <laughs> the previous speakers have set a high bar um, and I'll do my best to try and meet that bar. I'm going to be talking about a new class of uh, machine learning models or fairly new called neural processes. And I'm going to be talking about how these models have a range of kind of flexible modeling capabilities that enable their ability to tackle a range of different environmental prediction problems or prediction tasks. And I just want to start off by, you know, from the beginning, just uh, acknowledging that I don't exist in a vacuum, but rather, uh, you know, uh, exist in an atmosphere uh, that I share with many other people. And uh, some of these people I have the the pleasure and privilege of collaborating with, um, uh, such as the people on the screen here. And, you know, a lot of the work that I'll be um, sharing in this webinar was kind of informed by working with them. And indeed, I'll be sharing, you know, some direct research from uh, some of the people on the screen as well. And we hail from a range of different institutions, including uh, British Antarctic Survey or BAS, where I'm from, the University of Cambridge, uh, Microsoft Research, and also the Alan Turing Institute who fund uh, fund my research. Okay, so in terms of the outline of the talk, I'm going to start off from a high level thinking about the state of play of AI and environmental sciences, just to set the scene a bit. We're then going to um, look at the challenges of modeling environmental observations and how convolutional neural processes can address some of those challenges. I'm then going to present a kind of yeah, array of different um, experiments for different environmental prediction tasks that use ConvNPs, tackling different kinds of data fusion problems. I'm then going to, uh, for the first time publicly, uh, introduce uh, this new open source software uh, package that I've been developing called DeepSensor uh, for modeling environmental data with neural processes. And then uh, we'll wrap up with some closing thoughts. And, and if you have any questions, then I can uh, take any questions then. Cool, yeah. So starting off, as I said, um, kind of setting the scene a bit, I really wanted to um, highlight how much uh, uh, deep learning and machine learning has been kind of seeping into the environmental sciences. So this chart shows uh, the number of journal articles with the phrase deep learning either in the title or the abstract. And although deep learning started um, uh, kicking off, you know, in, in the kind of early 2010s, it took until you know around 2016, 2017, until it started being deployed for the first time in uh, environmental science papers. 
Now, uh, I've been in the game for a while, I'd say. So I've uh, I joined Bass in 2019. Um, I'm, I promise I'm not as vain as uh, putting this photo of myself here makes me look. I say at the time it felt like deep learning methods, machine learning methods had a lot of potential. There's a lot of kind of excitement, but there's also a lot of uncertainty and dare I say it, you know, a healthy dose of skepticism about how these methods could be used. And so it's kind of the stuff of um, hushed conversations in the corridor to, to put it in a slightly melodramatic way. And, you know, since then, you know, we're now here, but if we project the rate of paper public uh, publications out to the end of the year, we're going to be around up here in terms of the number of papers. And on a field-wise view, I'd say it feels like machine learning and AI has moved from the fringes of environmental science to what now feels like the frontiers, you know, the most advanced technology that's having some really exciting uh, examples of use uh, in the science. And, you know, so conferences now, there are, uh, you know, enormous volumes of posters deploying different machine learning and deep learning methods. I was at AGU, the world's largest earth sciences conference in Chicago in December. And I say, if I had to guess, it felt like 5% or 10% of talks and posters had uh, some kind of uh, machine learning element to them. And of course, now we have uh, webinar series like these as well. And I want to highlight one specific area that feels like it's having its eureka moment now. Um, I think this is the most exciting first example of deep learning achieving its ideal uh, application and use case uh, in environmental sciences, and that's weather forecasting. So I don't know if everyone's uh, aware, but there's been a bit of a revolution in machine learning based weather forecasting in the last year alone. I'll just run through this. So um, on Christmas Eve, uh, December 2022, uh, Google DeepMind gifted us with uh, GraphCast, which is a graph neural network based model for medium range global weather forecasting. And I think it took everyone in the field by surprise, the method um, outperformed the leading physics-based system, ECMWF, or the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting's state-of-the-art IFS system. And they outperformed the system on a whole range of different variables and, and pressure levels as well. Then Microsoft entered the game a bit with um, a month later with their Climax model, so trying to build a foundation model for weather and climate. So uh, taking the idea of a foundation model from large language modeling um, you know, behind like chat GPT and stuff where you have this huge base model trained on um, an abundance of simulation data and other types of data that can then be fine tuned and deployed on downstream tasks. And then just running through the last ones, you know, it's now been a kind of flurry of increasingly um, uh, rapid uh, papers one after the other, like a group of academics from Shanghai published this Feng Wu paper that looked um, very promising. And then a different Google DeepMind team released their model MetNet3 um, on kind of shorter range forecasting. And then Huawei uh, published their Pangu weather model in nature using 3D neural networks and transformer type architecture. And all this has led to ECMWF themselves releasing this preprint uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the rise of data-driven weather forecasting where they declare that a new numerical weather prediction paradigm is emerging, relying on inference from machine learning models. So I kind of just want to highlight, like, this is really exciting. So this is an exciting time to be in the game. And I'm not going to be talking about weather forecasting in this, uh, in this talk, but uh, rather I kind of just wanted to set the scene and show where, where things are going a little bit. Okay, so most of the uh, approaches um, in those papers that I just showed are trained on reanalysis data. So not direct observations of the environment, but rather state estimates that have come from numerical simulators that try to fit as closely as possible to observations, producing a nice complete gridded product. Now that's um, you know all well and good. And these state estimates are known to be the most accurate guess we have of what the earth is doing uh, across space. But what if our data isn't on a, on a nice, neat grid? OK, so real world environmental observations, for example. So, you know, what if we have missing data like this uh, land surface temperature satellite observation from MODIS of um, uh, surface temperature over Antarctica, which has cloud covered gaps? Or what about irregularly sampled data? 
such as in situ temperature stations across the Antarctic continent. Well, you know, if we were back in 2019, then, uh, you know, by that time, only the most uh, basic methods were uh, infiltrating into the field. And we might say, well, you know, this data is gridded. Let's chuck it into a CNN convolutional neural network that's well suited for image data. Uh, you know, there's an issue with this, which is that it can't handle NANs. So, you know, what do we put as these missing values? We can't just put minus one because the temperature could be minus one degrees Celsius, right? So uh, we need a different approach there. And then just thinking of the temperature stations, maybe we'll model this as a Gaussian process, right? That'd be a reasonable choice to make, you know, fit a spatial 2D Gaussian process to these temperature observations and try and fill the gaps or something. Well, GPs have some issues, so they can't ingest multiple data streams in uh, a simple way that I'm aware of. So how, we wouldn't be able to condition on uh, this uh, land surface temperature either. And they're also pretty computationally expensive uh, when implemented in, in a naive way and not very expressive, which can be an issue when we have an abundance of data that we want to learn from. Alternatively, we could try thinking of chucking this into a, a multi-layer perceptron, right? Just like a kind of vanilla neural network that uh, operates on vectors. So we'll put this station as station one, chuck it in uh, there, put this station as station two, chuck it in that element there get this station, which is recording a balmy uh, negative 88.2 degrees Celsius, uh, put that in the third element and so on until we've uh, put all of these uh, station observations into a vector. Okay, fair enough. Um, you could do that, but that's also not going to be what we want because this model also can't handle NANs if one of these stations broke on a certain day. We're also not going to be able to leverage new stations. So if a new station comes online, well, this model only operates on a fixed dimensional vector, so it can't leverage new stations. And it depends on the exact ordering that we chose of stations. So the one we chose to label station one and the one we chose to label station two and so on. So if we give our model weights to our friend and say, you know, here you go, uh, there's the data, try and model it, and they choose a different ordering, then the model's going to be uh, in a completely different part of input space that it's never seen before and it's going to break. So that was a bit labored, but that's just kind of motivation for why the most basic kind of machine learning approaches aren't going to work with environmental data. I'm going to cut to the chase and say that in order to model this data appropriately, we're going to need to model these observations as sets. So sets of observations where the ordering doesn't matter and we can have arbitrary length sequences of observations. Okay, so now we're finally going to have the convolutional neural process coming onto the stage. So I'm going to try and set the kind of uh, kind of theoretical and mathematical notational background here. And this is going to be the most mathsy slide. So apologies if that's not your way of thinking, but um, uh, at least it's here um, for those who like it. And you know you can just daydream for a minute if if you don't like this uh, um, this style of slide. But um, okay, so we're going to model, uh, or, or rather, we're going to call our uh, observational data sets, context sets, C. And we're going to have a range of different context sets like you saw on the previous slide. Let's index them with the index I. So each context set is going to be a set of locations and observations uh, pairs. So the first entry is going to be this uh, pair of uh, uh, the first X location, which could be latitude, longitude and then all of the observations associated at that point, which could be temperature. We could have multiple observations at this uh, specific location as well. Then we're going to have the next one and so on until uh, uh, we've um, reached the end of all the observations for this context set. OK, so that's our, you can think of this as like our input data streams. And then we're also going to have target sets. So that's where we want to predict. So that we're going to label this T. And we're going to have a set of locations that we want to predict at. Uh, these XTs, and we may or may not have observations there. Um, so let's just pretend that you know this might be an unknown variable, but we might um, we might also have observations that we can use to train. By the way, this is meant to be a Y here. Okay, so now one of the final bits of nomenclature here is that we're going to call the combination of all of these context sets and target sets a task. So we're going to want to build a model that can take in this task and predict the target data based on the context data. 
So now we're finally at the convolutional neural process. This is definitely the most complicated line, so I'll try and go through it fairly slowly. So the convolutional neural process is going to output a distribution over the target observation values uh, conditioned on uh, the target locations we want to predict at, as well as all of our context sets put together, which we can just call C. I'm going to show an example where it outputs a Gaussian distribution here. So it's going to be a normal distribution over the target values. And in a convolutional neural process, the mean and variance at all of these values is going to be a function which is parameterized by a neural network, in this case, a convolutional neural network. That's where the conv term comes from. And this, these functions, the mean and variance functions, are going to take in the target locations that we want to predict at, as well as an encoding of all of our context data. Now, this encoding is going to be constructed in such a way that it doesn't care about the ordering of observations. In other words, it's going to be permutation variant. And because we're using a CNN, uh, the whole model is also going to be translation equivariant with respect to the context data. Cool, yeah, that's most of the complicated stuff out of the way. Apologies if I lost you for a minute. Uh, we're going to see lots of the cool examples where um, you will um, hopefully build more intuition in the model. I'm going to add a disclaimer here that this is uh, the conditional neural process where we're not modeling correlations between target variables. We're just modeling them as independent. And this is also a variant with a Gaussian output distribution, but we could parameterize any distribution uh, with a, a neural process. And I'm just going to use the term ConvNP in a kind of variant and distribution agnostic way to kind of refer to the superset of all possible models that you can construct in this way. OK, um, I, I really want to highlight how the encoder works, because I think it's really cool and um, it builds a lot of intuition. So the encoder in conv MPs uh, uh, that we typically use is called a set conv. And let's say we have two context sets. We have station observations at these black crosses. And let's say we also have some gridded data set containing auxiliary information like elevation and land mass. When we input that to a set conv, out the other side, we get a 3D tensor which is going to have density channels for each context set, which says where we have observations. So you can see the kind of sparse station locations here, and then a flat channel, because this was a gridded uh, variable here. And then we have data channels, which are the actual values that were observed. And the reason we need the density channel is if you observe a zero, then that's going to be nothing in the data channel. So we need to tell the model that there was an observation there. OK. So that's how that works. And what then happens is, so we process this, uh, all our context sets with a set conv. We input that to a unit, OK, just a, a type of convolution neural network, and then interpolate the output of the unit at our target locations. Optionally, we can then inject some extra data with a kind of output multilayer perceptron. That's going to appear in some of our models. It's a variant that we've worked with sometimes. But in any case, we're going to then parameterize the distribution over targets at the target locations. And the parameters of our distribution, so like the mean and variance, for example, is now going to depend on the context data itself, so the actual observations that were observed. And because of this, um, this is called meta-learning, because it's like we've trained one model, but then it can kind of train in inverted commas when you give it new data. And it's going to learn how to kind of set the parameters of the distribution. I'm not going to lean too heavily in that interpretation, um, but I just thought I'd mention it. Now, what this uh, allows is um, a bunch of key modeling capabilities that help us with spatiotemporal modeling. So we can fuse multiple gridded data streams. We can fuse off the grid data with on the grid data. We can handle multiple resolutions by passing them through a set conf and interpolating them onto an internal grid. We can handle missing data because of the density channels. We can also predict at arbitrary target locations. So we're not fixed to only predict at the locations we trained on. And because we're parameterizing distributions, we're quantifying our uncertainty. And in most of the variants of uh, conv NPs that you'll see, that you will see rather, uh, 
the inference cost is going to be linear in the number of context points or the number of target points. So it's going to be very computationally cheap uh, uh, to run this type of model. Cool. So that's the ConvMP. I'm going to pause just for a moment because that's maybe a lot to take in. And now we're going to move on to an array of different experiments using this model. So I'm going to start off with one of, well, actually the first uh, example of using convolutional neural processes in environmental sciences. So let's just start off from a high level. So we're going to be thinking about statistical downscaling here to kind of spoil it a little bit. But let's say I give you some gridded reanalysis data like this. I also give you some very high resolution auxiliary background information. This is Germany, by the way. Um, and then also uh, a bunch of in situ stations measuring you know, hyper local environmental conditions. How can we combine these three variables or data sets in order to you know, do something useful, produce some kind of useful environmental predictions? So, yeah, it's an interesting challenge. You know, we've got different modalities, different resolutions. The way that uh, this has been done in the literature, uh, which is an approach led by my collaborator, Anna Vaughan, um, who published this paper in 2022. Um, uh, and uh, I'm just, uh, the stuff on the screen here is basically like a very stripped down version of her paper. So go and check out the paper if you're keen for more. So what we do in uh, this downscaling approach is that we have our input reanalysis data. And in this case, I've coarsened era five to a really coarse scale to try and uh, um, ex uh, exemplify this approach. So it's going to be 1.25 by 1.25 or about 120 kilometers in resolution. I'm also going to input some kind of medium resolution elevation data, eight kilometer, still you know, over 10 times uh, finer resolution than the era five data but not as fine as it gets. We're going to chuck this into a convolutional neural process. And as I showed before, there was that option of kind of injecting new information right before your prediction. And that's what we're going to do with downscaling. So we're going to inject 500 meter resolution auxiliary data just before the prediction is made. And this is going to be kind of static topographic information. And uh, we're going to train the model to predict what uh, temperature stations observed over Germany. And uh, in Anna Vaughan's paper, uh, she showed that this uh, architecture can outperform a whole suite of different statistical downscaling methods. Um, so yeah, very impressive and robust architecture. And you know, here are some training results. I trained this model on 2006 to 2017 data and then validated on 2018. Um, I, you know, I was quite lazy, as you can see. I pr probably could have kept training, but um, could, got impatient. Uh, so now let's look at a prediction on a test date that the model's never seen before. So again, we're passing in our, our era five data. And when we make the model predict at a very fine resolution, we get this nice kind of detailed map of predictions, which picks out all of the high frequency variation in the auxiliary data. And of course, we get a mean and also a standard deviation capturing our uncertainty. If we kind of expand a little region here, um, you can see a little bit more the kind of spatial scale of detail uh, in the valleys and, and mountains and whatnot. And if I zoom in to the site of an actual station here, what I'm plotting on this time series is the Convent Peace prediction in blue, the actual station observation in green, and then the era five kind of grid cell average at that location in orange. And the model was trained on this station before. I have to caveat that. I was kind of lazy. I didn't hold out this station. Um, but it hasn't seen this date before. It hasn't seen this, uh, this, this two-month period of data. And it's kind of striking how it's kind of non-trivially predicting what the station observes um, and always capturing the true value within its 95% confidence interval. And I say non-trivial because it's um, it's not just kind of offsetting the era five value by a constant amount. Um, you know, you see here it kind of agrees with era five. Here it offsets it by quite a, lot, a wide margin. So that's very interesting. Now, some caveats with this approach is that 
if you think about our gridded data that we use in this approach, the, the data needs to kind of sufficiently correlate with our station observations, um, you know, have a sufficiently strong relationship. If it does, we can train a model and then deploy it on simulation data that runs out to 2100, for example, and get local scale downscale predictions. I'm not a downscaling person, so, you know, I find that cool, but it's not why I work on uh, day to day. But um, I think that's a very neat aspect of what you can do with downscaling, um, you know, looking at local uh, climate change impacts. Um, just to, as an aside comment. Um, another caveat with the auxiliary data is that, uh, you know, the availability of this data is really important. It needs to reveal the station microclimate. Um, so, um, you know, it needs to kind of, you know, in the case of temperature, elevation is a pretty strong predictor. What about urban density? What about fields, for example? That could also affect something or, you know, density of trees and whatnot. In terms of the stations, we need sufficient coverage in this auxiliary space so the model can learn um, how to kind of uh, leverage these auxiliary variables to predict what would actually be observed. So, yeah, as I mentioned, you know, if we're missing auxiliary channels, then we might not be doing the best job that we could be. Here's an example uh, that one of my colleagues did where it kind of didn't work amazingly in our initial attempts. And this was trying to downscale soil moisture over the UK. So taking an era five soil moisture, taking in topographic data and trying to predict. And I've kind of overlaid the station locations and then the model prediction. So you can see from the black crosses that they're, they're quite sparse. Um, and they also are mostly concentrated in the south, um, uh, south of Britain, and you know not so much in the highlands in in the high uh, topographically varying areas, and the spatial patterns just don't appear that realistic. So it didn't work that well in this case, but I don't think all hopes lost. You know, it's an open question as to whether we could do transfer learning from different regions. Like I think in the U.S., I believe there's a greater volume and density of soil moisture stations. It'd be interesting to transfer across space. Um, and also try multitask learning, for example, like if it's trying to downscale different environmental variables, some of which might have a, a greater abundance of, uh, of observations, then the model might be able to learn a kind of more generic representation of the environment. Say if we're trying to downscale precipitation at the same time, then there might be some kind of shared features uh, that would be useful for this task. So those are kind of open questions to explore. Now this is kind of a slight red herring, but I pretty much yesterday ran this experiment and I don't know what to call this. Um, it's kind of like high resolution station interpolation is the best word I could come up for it. So in this setup, we have stations on the context side and then our, our kind of slightly coarse scale elevation data as well. And the station context points are shown as black circles. Sorry, I've been lazy. So both of these plots show both the context and target scatter points. And then on the target side, we're going to have, we're going to be trying to predict station observations as well. And we're also going to, as before, inject high resolution information just before the prediction. So in this case, it's going to, it's not, it's not downscaling a gridded variable, but it's trying to interpolate other station observations while also leveraging you know, very high resolution auxiliary information. When we look at a prediction on a test date and condition the model on 20 randomly located uh, real station observations, you can see the model's prediction for the temperature across space here and the model's uncertainty. And, you know, there's all sorts of interesting high frequency features going on. But we also have a probabilistic model here that's actually conditioning on what was observed to inform the prediction. And as we add more and more observations, I think this is 100 observations here, the model's going to update its estimate for what's going on. And I think it's interesting to see that, um, um, well, you can't actually see it here because the color bar goes down lower, but the, um, the uncertainty never goes to zero exactly. And that's because station data has noise on it, you know, we might not be capturing all the auxiliary information that we need for this task. Um, so it's not going to exactly fit all of the observations, but you can see how it's being, the station observations are being used to inform like the bigger picture of what the temperature is in the surrounding area. Now, in an extreme case, giving the model all 500 or so German temperature stations, and you can see it can build up quite a detailed picture 
across the country now and um, with quite low uncertainty everywhere apart from high altitude type regions um, you can see it's now realizing that it's quite a chilly day across the country you know around my uh, around four degrees to the north and around you know, minus four degrees in the higher altitude uh, alpine regions to the south feel a bit like a, a weather presenter now um, that was weird anyway uh, if we zoom into this region uh, in the Alps, we can just like, I guess, um, yeah, just exemplify the high frequency information we're seeing. So I've, I've saturated the color bar at zero just to, um, I've, sorry, um, chopped it off at zero so that the color bar doesn't saturate. Um, but yeah, we can see lots of fine scale information. And yeah, the most uncertain regions are definitely at the peaks of mountains here. So that was a bit of a random experiment, might be useful um, uh, uh, for future work. I'm now going to switch tact a bit towards uh, sensor placement. Um, so this is some work that I've recently been doing using active learning. I'm going to introduce active learning and then, uh, and then the research project that we did. Okay, so active learning, what is active learning? It has two ingredients. You need a probabilistic model that's going to produce a distribution over the target values given some data. OK, that's ingredient one. Ingredient two is an acquisition function that you define. And this acquisition function, alpha of x, is going to say how useful a new observation at point x is going to be for the model. We can then kind of combine these two ingredients and um, iteratively propose new observation locations in a so-called greedy algorithm that, that optimizes one step at a time and produce a kind of vector or tensor of proposed placement um, uh, locations for new observations. So here's a, a little kind of toy animation of this in, in um, progress. So we have a probabilistic model in green that's being fit to this kind of hillscape sort of sinusoidal uh, curve and it's iteratively proposing new uh, observation locations in red, given these initial uh, black observations, uh, these black circles here. And uh, you can see how it kind of gets iteratively closer and closer to the true function that it's trying to predict, uh, while also avoiding the existing observation locations. OK, but that's a very toy example. But we're going to use basically the same uh, philosophy in, 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 in this project. OK, so yeah, um, this is a project that I led um, that has very recently been published in environmental data science. So this is just yesterday for those watching uh, online right now. And um, I believe, to the best of my knowledge, that this is the first, uh, first um, study to look into the active learning capabilities of a convolutional neural process type model. And what we're trying to do is use active learning to work out where we need to go and place new observations for temperature over Antarctica, so new station locations. And I'm um, yeah, adding QR codes for the paper here. Um, please uh, go and give it some love, given that it just came out yesterday. I haven't even announced this on Twitter yet, so you are the first to hear about it. And uh, I'm also going to mention that I'm not going to go into too much detail here because there is a conference talk, 15 minute conference talk that I gave specifically on this, um, specifically on this study. So do go and check that out as well if you're more interested. But I will show some results. So um, the model we used is actually uh, a convolutional Gaussian neural process, so conv GNP. So this variant of a conv NP outputs a joint Gaussian distribution over target points not a bunch of independent distributions, but a correlated Gaussian. So it's going to output a mean function, but also a covariance function, or you know, when you sample at target locations, a covariance matrix. So we're going to be able to draw coherent samples over our unknown target variable conditioned on our observations. And yeah, we take in um, uh, temperature on the left and also a gridded auxiliary context set in order to um, allow the model to break translation equivariance with respect to the temperature stations. And um, this allows the model to learn non-stationary covariance. But that's a technical detail that uh, we don't need to go into now. 
Okay, so we have a bit of a chicken and egg problem with sensor placement and these models. Um, the issue is that to train a model to learn where we need new observations, we need a lot of data to train a big flexible model that will be really accurate at finding great new locations or observations. But then if we have lots of new, lots of observations to do that, then do we really need new observations in the first place? Okay, so that was kind of the head scratcher for me because um, Antarctica is not known for its abundance of observations. And the way that I got around this um, in our project is to train the model on reanalysis data. So we trained the Conf GMP to spatially interpolate era five daily average two meter temperature anomaly like the animation you, show, you see uh, shown on the right. Okay, so what do we mean by spatially interpolate? Um, what we do is we randomly sample grid cells to be the context data on the left-hand side. We also randomly sample grid cells to be the target points on the right-hand side. And then we just train a conv GMP to um, maximize the target probability over the target points. So yeah, it's pretty uh, simple, I would say. And these are going to be operating on a kind of day by day basis. So it's only going to see observations from a given day and it's trying to predict what's going on elsewhere for that same day, just to clarify. Now, when we train this model and run a sensor placement algorithm, we get what you see here. So, you know, similar to the hillscape, but in a much larger scale, more complex problem. And on the right side, for good measure, we have a vanilla kind of Gaussian process baseline model. And what I'm showing as the heat map is the acquisition function that we use, which is the predicted drop in variance when the model sees a new observation at that location. So how much does this observation decrease the model's uncertainty? And uh, we could stare at this all day, but um, I'm going to jump to the chase and just show you some results. So when we look at the root mean squared error at predicting across space um, versus the number of sensors added to the model at these locations, era five sensors in this case, and look at the conf GMP's performance versus the Gaussian process model's performance. You can see the conf GMP starts off with better RMSE, um, but also despite that is able to reduce its error faster. And at the end of the day, finds better sensor placements in inverted commas according to these results. And the paper with QR code again in the top right has much more detailed um, uh, experiments with different probabilistic metrics and also a non-stationary Gaussian process baseline. And GPs, by the way, have been, you know, in the field of environmental sciences for decades uh, under the term of Krigging. Um, so a very classical geostatistics approach. But yeah, I think we are starting to find more advanced methods that can um, uh, uh, do more interesting things. Okay, a limitation of this approach is that it's trained on reanalysis, not observations. Um, yeah, so it's kind of not going to be measuring the observation of uh, the informativeness of real sensors, right? Like these are idealized zero noise observations because reanalysis doesn't have any noise or uncertainty on it. Um, so uh, yeah, um, we've been exploring this. Um, we've been exploring tackling this rather. So myself and Professor Rich Turner have been working with this master's student, Jonas Schultz who's done a fantastic job looking at trying to alleviate this using sim to real for um, temperature interpolation in Germany. So in this case, our simulated phase is era five pre-training, and then we transfer the model uh, to the real phase where we fine tune on real station observations. So yeah, randomly sampled era five observations during pre-training, and then we randomly split, split the station data into context and target during fine tuning. And the idea is that the model would hopefully kind of leverage all the information contained in this data set uh, of era five but also learn interesting new characteristics from the station data like um, you know noise on the data and whatnot what we see if we look at the model's uncertainty when it's just pre-trained on era five uh, where yellow means um, very certain and confident and then darker means more uncertain is that as we uh, fine-tune on more and more stations the model kind of increasingly becomes increasingly uncertain around station locations. Um, and you see this by the yellow blobs kind of disappearing. And that's a good thing because the station doesn't 
you know, tell you exactly what's going on in the surrounding area for tens of kilometers. Um, so we don't want it to pass exactly through observations. So it's, it's, it's kind of behaving as we would hope. Uh, Jonas also ran this uh, sensor placement approach um, that I showed you earlier, but with the fine-tuned model. So yeah, era five on the left and fine-tuned on the right. And you can see that it, the acquisition function becomes a bit more diffuse. Um, I won't go into the details, but um, it, it does seem like it's doing uh, something reasonable. And this is now measuring the informativeness of real station observations. So our finding is that um, on some kind of like pelled out results is that pre-training on era five does help with uh, predicting observational station data um, as opposed to not pre-training at all, but it does become less important and useful to pre-train on era five as more and more observational data becomes available, which is kind of intuitive. Uh, another uh, cool uh, uh, experiment from uh, collaborator Paolo Pellucci, who did a secondment with the Alan Turing Institute over the summer, uh, is that he's been looking into aerosol sensor placement. So with a target variable of black carbon, uh, specifically black carbon aerosol optical depth, which is um, a variable that has a highly, you know, black carbon has a highly uncertain effect on warming and is quite sparsely observed. So quite an important variable to uh, get better measurements of. And he used uh, the same kind of uh, reanalysis training phase using CAMS reanalysis, and we haven't looked into fine tuning just yet, and using the AeroNet sensor network to initialize the context set for the sensor placement. And you can see comparing the reanalysis with the model's prediction uh, after initializing with observations at the context, uh, uh, initializing context set at the sensor network. It's making like reasonable predictions for the large scale uh, aerosol phenomena. And here are the results of the sensor placement algorithm. Um, they're you know, fair few in Russia, which isn't a great uh, place for sensor placements at the moment. But you know other ones in kind of North African uh, coastline and uh, some in Norway and whatnot. So yeah, this is a, an exciting uh, uh, other application of this work. Okay, what if I told you that all of the experiments that you've just seen in this talk use the same Python package? So I apologize for the slightly crass meme, but you know I do share the same name as Neo from the Matrix, so I, I guess I kind of had to. Um, but yeah, so everything you've seen use the same Python package to run the experiments. And now we're going to look at this. So uh, this is this Python package that I've been developing called Deep Sensor. And this is kind of just like a information dump, high level overview of the design philosophy that I'm going to walk you through. So Deep Sensor is a Python package for modeling environmental data with neural processes. You can pip install it now, and there's a QR code up there to the GitHub repository. But I do want to highlight a user warning that this is a work in progress. So if you're interested in using it, then um, it's probably best to contact me first. Although, you know, that might not be true in a few months' time. It might be in a more stable uh, uh, place then. But just looking at the design high level, um, you can see that everything above this line lives in X-Array and Pandas world. So the user only sees X-Ray and Pandas data that we all know and love. For example, gridded data here, time series data here. That's then going to um, come into a data processor, which is going to normalize and standardize the data. We then have a task loader that's going to generate uh, tasks for training a neural process model. And then we have this convNP model class, which actually inherits from this base class probabilistic model, which um, um, itself is subclassed by this deep sensor model. And these, uh, these classes live partially in this um, world of tensors, so TensorFlow, PyTorch, and NumPy, that the user doesn't have to interact with if they don't want to. Um, and the ConvNP is implemented using this fantastic Python package called Neural Processes uh, that was authored by my collaborator, Vessel Brinsma. It's a fantastic package, like really flexible, really nice design philosophy, uh, but it does live in kind of a tensor world, which can be a bit inconvenient when all of your data has all this rich metadata and functionality of X-Ray and Pandas. So what I've tried to do is uh, is, is kind of combine those two um, or these two worlds. And the ConvMP can directly output unnormalized gridded predictions or off the grid predictions. And then we also have our active learning functionality as well. So yeah, and another thing I'd like to highlight is that 
uh, it's designed so that the models are extensible. You know, you could put your model here and leverage all the same nice functionality. Um, still to be tried and tested, but um, I'm very keen that that feature works because the convenp isn't necessarily the be-all and end-all, and, and I would like this package to uh, be able to be updated with the latest um, uh, latest models. So yeah, my hopes for this package is that it lowers the barrier to entry, both for environmental scientists and machine learners. I hope that it will galvanize research progress, um, you know, building a, a community around this open source software, uh, leading to a kind of positive feedback loop where software improves research, then research improves software. Blue sky thinking is that this could uh, hopefully become like a leading piece of software for the latest environmental ML paradigms. And I'm going to rush through the kind of uh, conclusions, but first, uh, don't take my word for it that Deep Sensor is worth checking out, but check out this te testimonial from a comment um, uh, on one of our issues from Zeal Patel. Deep Sensor has an easy to use interface simil similar to Scikit-Learn and its seamless integration with X-Array saves a lot of time and energy to pre-process and post-process the data. So thank you, Zeal, for the, f for the kind comment. Um, yeah. As I said, closing thoughts, but uh, I'm uh, I'm running towards the ends of time, so I'm just going to kind of zip through this. Um, I'd say we're entering a new phase of environmental machine learning with more and more versatile modeling capabilities. Convolutional neural processes are one such kind of model, and they can tackle a range of prediction tasks, such as those that you've seen and more. So you know, also forecasting, filling missing satellite data, and so on. Deep Sensor is this package that you can use if you want. And uh, I just want to clarify that ConvMPs are not a panacea. So it's an, actually an active area of research. And I'm sure that we're going to discover limitations and also improvements over time. And there are other novel machine learning architectures out there, like graph neural networks or transformers that also have a lot of exciting potential. Um, some challenges is that uh, these models have to learn how to condition on data. So they start from square one. And this can make them quite data hungry. So, you know, you can't give the model an entirely new data stream that it's never seen before or been trained on in any re resemblance and expect it to be able to produce like good predictions conditioning on that data. We had this chicken and egg problem with sensor placement, but I showed how we could sort of try and get around it using pre training. Um, but one remaining challenge is how we could scale to high dimensions. So, you know, adding depth and altitude as a dimension or hundreds or thousands of observational variables. That would be a, a very interesting challenge going forward. And then finally, just like future work would be transfer learning, as I mentioned earlier, from dense to sparsely monitored regions, infilling missing satellite data, such as this preliminary work from um, Pondavan et al. Uh, I think that maybe should be 2022. Um, with quite a cool paper trying this out to fill in um, scan lines. And sensor trajectories would be a cool thing rather than fixed placements. OK, yeah, neural process timeline for those who are watching this on YouTube and want to pause and, and have a look at some references. Um, yeah, thanks so much for your time and attention. Uh, I've got my two QR codes for the things I want to promote here. Also, feel free to reach out on uh, my contact details here. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Tom. That's really very interesting. And uh, yeah, really good to have a talk that kind of goes a deep dive into the method. Wasn't too deep, I'd say. But uh, again, yeah, it gives a really nice description of the kind of pros and cons of that um, yeah, outlining the method and how it deals with the sort of different modalities and different um, missing data and stuff and really kind of shows why it's a beneficial method in environmental science where yeah, missing data in particular is a, quite a big issue. So we've got um, a good few questions in the chat. I'll just try and get them in in an order that sort of makes sense. Well, there's some deep digging into the into the methods then so when would you choose to use a conv np versus a conv gmp and can you explain the difference again that might not yeah. be a quick one yeah well I'll, I'll try and be quick um so wait this isn't the right slide um this one uh yeah so conv gmp is going to output a joint distribution so you're going to have an n-dimensional gaussian vector with a covariance matrix whereas a conv cnp conditional neural process which is model in most of the experiments that I've shown you uh, just does independent distributions at each location. You should use a conf GMP if you care about spatial patterns. So for example, you can run this model in an active learning way 
to minimize uncertainty about spatial patterns by minimizing the overall uncertainty of this big joint distribution over predictions. Whereas if you only care about the predictions at point-wise locations, you don't care about how they're related to create patterns, then a conf CMP is fine and probably a better idea because it's going to be more aligned with uh, what you care about. Yeah. Thanks. While, it, while you're on the slide, one of the other questions is why do you need the unit in there? Why do you need the unit? Um, well, it's a very tried and tested deep learning architecture. This component injects a huge amount of flexibility in the model. So it means that the model is going to have a lot of capability to learn arbitrary mean functions and covariance functions that get spat out the output side of this model. And a unit goes from gridded predictions to gridded predictions. So it's going to operate on this kind of internal grid of the ConfGMP that I talk about more in the appendix of our paper. Um, and you need to go from grid to grid. So you need a kind of deep learning architecture that goes from, you know, goes from on the grid to on the grid, um, which you can then interpolate at your target locations. Hopefully that makes sense. Brilliant, thanks. Um, and is the, on the density inputs, that was on another slide, is that just a binary map sort of showing where there's data and where there's no data? Good question, yeah. So it's not binary, it's actually like uh, we place a tiny Gaussian blob at each observation location. And that's going to make a kind of function, hypothetically, uh, across space with like these blobs at observation locations. But we then discretize at the kind of internal grid locations of the model, which then gives us a tensor. Um, and so you could do this in other ways, right? Like you could just kind of have this internal grid and you like nearest neighbor bin, like a binary mask, as you say. Um, well, you'd need to account for the case where there's multiple uh, observations in one internal discretization grid cell. Um, but yeah, that's not the, the Gaussian kind of blob way isn't the only way of doing this. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. So probably the last one on the technical side of things. So you mentioned updating, which sounds kind of Bayesian. A con NP is linked to a Bayes approach in updating priors. Yeah, that's a that's really um, that's an interesting technical question. So yeah. Um, a neural process, when you train a neural process, it's uh, if we assume that our data is generated from some probabilistic model, like say a Gaussian process, then training the neural process is going to um, train the model to target the predictive distribution of the, um, or the predictive stochastic process rather, when you condition on observations. That's kind of, that might not, might not be might not have explained that very well, but essentially it's not doing Bayesian conditioning in the case where you have like you have your prior, then it's just that's all the information your model has. You condition it on observations, and then it has this kind of um, built-in Bayesian update step using Bayes rule. So a, a conv NP doesn't use Bayes rule; it kind of breaks Bayes rule, and that might you know make Bayesian people turn in turn in their grave. But um, I think it makes more sense when you know that your distribution is misspecified. So we know our model isn't, we know our data isn't generated from a GP. So our model is much more flexible when it's actually trying to target an arbitrary Gaussian process predictive, like in the case of the conf GMP. It's not just a fixed prior that you then condition using Bayes rule. However, the model does learn a prior because if you just don't give the model any data, then that's a prior. But as soon as you start conditioning on more observations, it's going to start to deviate from what you would get from your distribution if you were just conditioning that prior using Bayes rule, because it's going through a neural network, uh, essentially. There's kind of more discussion on that on like the last slide of our um, of our 30 page appendix on the sensor placement paper, if you're interested. Great. Yeah, good to point to point people to those again, maybe stick those QR codes up again, just in case people didn't get a chance to look. So Good away time. from the technical side of things, people are saying, what um, what type of users would you like to see or hope to see using your deep sensor package, which, which it says looks amazing, by the way, or in other words, which domains do you see potential for the crossover of these methods? Oh, that's a nice question. Thanks for asking. Um, I think these models are really flexible and can be used in a, a wide range of different environmental um, prediction problems and different domains. Uh, I think, you know, these models, as I said, are quite data hungry. So uh, I'd say 
Um, I think there's a lot of promise in using this approach and, and deep sensor. If you have spatiotemporal data, which is maybe quite messy, but maybe you have like you know quite um, large volumes of it in some sense of the word. Um, and in terms of users that I'm interested in, um, very open-minded. Um, yeah, happy to discuss like a research idea and um, maybe have some a bit of collaboration using deep sensor as a as a gateway. Um, but yeah, um, I'd say there are lots of open questions as to when and when this approach doesn't work and when it does work. And what I want is to build up this community around this package that we can use to save everyone's time and, um, and, you know, really understand when these models shine and when they may unfortunately fall down. So I'm, I'm very, um, open in terms of, um, you know, different kinds of users. That's great. Thanks, Tom. So maybe as, as a final uh, well, comment and question, yeah, I think those those sorts of packages are going to be really useful to yeah to help the kind of wider uptake of these types of methods or you know, testing them and then and then uptake. Um, what what kind of what do you say is the sort of challenges of maintaining that type of um, the sort of packages or that sort of infrastructure around this type of modeling? And what any thoughts on how that could be better supported? So, for example, I know the Software Sustainability Institute does some little bit of work on on scientific package um, maintenance, but um, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, really good question. I think I think you need a whole community involved. Um, I think you need people with different kinds of expertise from the more research end of the spectrum who can actually drive the kind of engine of usefulness in the software. And you also need people on the more software development side of things, getting the thing to actually work and be extensible and uh, be maintainable. Uh, I'm kind of increasingly moving to somewhere in the middle as a bit of a kind of research engineering type science person, um, but I'm still learning. And you know we haven't reached version 1.0 yet of this thing, so the interface could change. But I think this could do with a review process. Like I, if I had the time, I'd love to submit this to a software uh, peer-reviewed um, journal and just benefit from that peer review process. And I would love to, and I am making some steps towards trying to formalize um, getting more people involved and committed because I do think you need, uh, if you want maintainers to be involved, you need them to be working on uh, on the code base on a semi-regular basis at least. And the Alan Turing Institute is, you know, the UK's national Research Center for Data Science and AI, and I, I think there's going to be a lot of potential for collaborations there. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much, Tom. I will um, wrap it up on that. So, thanks very much again for the for the um, for the talk. It's really interesting. Thanks everyone for attending. Like I said, this is the final one in this webinar series. So, thanks if you came to some of them. Check them out on the YouTube channel. Like I said before, including the the uh, the deep mind talk on graphcast which was earlier in the series and um yeah thanks very much for coming along and yeah hopefully see some of you at the digital environment event on the 5th of september bye thanks for having me